let's get this show on the road. My name is Anna Myers. I work at Grow Capitus. My business partner is Neil Bawa. We buy apartment buildings all over the United States, as well as other uh, forms of commercial real estate. Um, but more than that, we're also all about education. And we like to help people uh, develop knowledge so that they can buy their own commercial real estate and so that they can also know what they're doing. We have a data-driven approach. We feel like we have a, our brand is differentiated by the data science that we bring to the field. Uh, my business partner, Neil Bawa, is a very well-known um, man in the industry as being an innovator, um, just an out-of-the-box thinker. He is known as the mad scientist of multifamily by his friends, and uh, he lives up to his name. We are always experimenting and all about the science of real estate to the benefit of our investors who can rely on us to do an extreme level of due diligence, not only when we're acquiring a property, but when we're asset managing a property, we bring our data science to that as well, to always make sure that we're being the most efficient with the way we're running a property. So that's who I am. And by the way, I'm the lead underwriter for the group. And I um, always work with great um, lenders. And John Brixen is one of those lenders. John and I have uh, known each other and been uh, corresponding for what, maybe about nine months, John? Yeah, at least nine months, I would yeah. say. Yeah, we've had spent a lot of time on the phone um, talking about markets, talking about deals. Um, and I've always really appreciated how giving um, John was of his time and his knowledge. Um, so we formed a great relationship, a great business relationship along those lines. And we are really happy to have us have him here on our webinar. Um, before I turn it over to John, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We will be sending the replay of the webinar as well as the uh, presentation in PDF format out to everybody who is attending as well as everybody who signed up. So don't worry, you're gonna get the slide as PDF as well as a replay so you can listen to this all over again. Um, the other thing I wanna tell you is that you are welcome to um, type questions as we go either into the chat or into the Q&A. If, if it is an appropriate moment for me to interrupt John to ask your question, um, I will do that. Um, however, I want to say that most of your questions are probably going to be held towards to the end of the presentation, just so that he can get his flow going. But I will be um, trying to um, track, um, answer all of the questions that we are able to answer in the time that we have. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my friend, John Brickson. All right. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to Neil and the rest of the Multifamily U team for having me on. My name is John Brixen, and I'm a national multifamily lender with Old Capital Lending. I'm based in Dallas, Texas, and on this webinar, I'm going to be discussing some of the most common financing sources for multifamily properties. Sorry about that. Good thing that happened early. Putting my phone on mute. On this webinar, I'm going to be discussing some of the most common multifamily financing or financing sources for multifamily properties. And I'm going to go into greater detail about Freddie Mac's small balance loan program, which I believe is one of the best financing sources in the market. And I especially think that's true for newer or first time multifamily investors. Um, so as Ann had mentioned, please type your questions into the chat box and we can get to those questions towards the end of the presentation. So just getting started here with the agenda. So first I'll provide an overview of banks, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and also provide a comparison on each one of those lending sources and how each is different. I'll also provide a brief overview on bridge loans. After touching on some of those different uh, loan types for multifamily, I'm going to do a deeper dive on the Freddie Mac Small Balance Loan Program, which I believe, like I said in my opener, uh, that it's one of the better loan programs available in the market, but especially for newer or inexperienced multifamily investors. Um, once we review the Freddie Small Balance Program in more detail, I'll review a couple of different case studies of recent Freddie Small Balance loans that I've closed, and I'll wrap up the overview 
more of the presentation with an overview of my group, uh, Old Capital Lending, and discuss how we can get in touch and help you with financing your next multifamily investment. And then, as Anna had mentioned, we'll end the presentation with uh, next steps and some Q and A. Uh, so, some background on myself. So, I'm a nationwide lender. Uh, I joined Old Capital in February of 2018. 2018, sorry. And to date, I've closed loans in, of course, the Dallas-Fort Worth market, Houston, Seattle, Kansas City, Florida, Minnesota, Virginia, um, and currently closing loans in South Dakota, Kansas City, and of course, a couple of other loans in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth market. Um, I was born and raised in Kansas City, but I've been based in DFW since 2014. I have a BA in economics from DePaul University in Indiana, and I have seven years of experience in commercial real estate financing and investing. Uh, over the course of my career, I've been involved with the origination and underwriting of over a billion dollars in commercial real estate loans across all property types, but I now focus on BNC multifamily, uh, which I believe to be the best property type and the best niche to, uh, to focus on. Um, the current market cycle, correct? Well, current market cycle and just overall and over time, I mean, uh, multifamily is outperformed self-storage, office, retail, industrial uh, throughout multiple cycles and has really been kind of a tried and true uh, asset class or property type where downside has been limited and uh, you know, upside has still been significant. Um, Very true. So it's a great, great property type to, to focus on. Um, so getting started with our presentation here. So there's a number of different loan sources for multifamily and, and like Anna and I were just talking about, you know, like equity investors, lenders have recognized that multifamily is, is the best property type out there. And, you know, given the attractiveness of multifamily, there's a lot of different financing sources available for multifamily. Um, but for now, I'm just going to provide a high level overview of the three most common sources of financing for multifamily, which are banks, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, so we'll cover the minimum loan size on each, uh, talk about recourse versus non recourse and, and which which lenders uh, can provide non recourse options, uh, the typical loan terms. So how long of a loan term will each lender provide amortization? Uh, max LTV or maximum leverage you can get with which each source of uh, financing property occupancy and what kind of occupancy uh, certain lenders look for. We'll talk about the rehab budget. So uh, lenders will finance part of your purchase price. Some of them will provide you with funds for the rehab. If you're budgeting any rehab, uh, some of them will not provide funds for rehab. So we'll touch on that. We'll talk about prepayment penalties and then also borrower experience and, and what lenders are looking for in terms of, of borrower experience. So first touching on the minimum loan amount. So there's really no minimum loan size for banks, uh, but the minimum loan size for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is a million dollars. And so you can actually, you can go down to 750,000 uh, with Fannie and Freddie in certain situations, but overall, the rule of thumb that I always stick to with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in terms of minimum loan size, I would say is, is a million dollars. Um, so that being said, banks are often the best source of financing for smaller properties. So, you know, the eight unit property that's being acquired for $500,000 is too small for Fannie or Freddie, but it's too large for a conventional residential mortgage as anything five units and above is considered commercial. So that being said, you know, your main option for financing for a property of that size is going to be banks. And to me, one of the biggest positives of multifamily investing, and one of the reasons why I think it's one of the best property types is that you have some of the best loan terms available for commercial real estate with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, they don't finance self storage, office, industrial, or retail. They only finance commercial apartment buildings, so five units and above, uh, at least under their multifamily program. Obviously, Fannie and Freddie do loans for single family properties as well, but they only finance commercial apartment buildings 
uh, and the, their minimum loan size is generally $1 million. And so uh, I always encourage investors to target properties that have a purchase price of at least 1.5 million or properties that could eventually that could eventually be worth 1.5 million upon stabilization as at 1.5 million, that's a property that has a large enough value that could support uh, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. John, we have a question that we, you know, just to clear it as we look through all of these things, you're talking about commercial real estate being five units and above. What about a portfolio of single family homes? So somebody looking for a single loan, there's a, a seller that wants to dump their entire single family portfolio. Would that qualify? Uh, they do not. Um, so, so Freddie Mac did have a program for portfolios of single family homes. Um, and they, it was a pilot program that they tested out in 2017, maybe first half of 2018. And they've recently decided to pull out of that market. So they don't have a single family uh, portfolio program. There are non-recourse lenders out there that will finance single family portfolios, but those are private lenders and the rates are, are not as competitive as uh, the rates that you would get with a Fannie or Freddie loan on a, on a multifamily property. Great, thanks. So next topic that we can touch on is recourse. Um, so this is a key differentiating factor when we compare banks with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So banks are typically full recourse, meaning the borrower needs to sign a personal, uh, a personal repayment guarantee, um, while Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are non-recourse, meaning that there's no uh, personal repay repayment guarantee required. And just to, to, to underline or clarify, so a full recourse loan, you know, basically that means that you are signing a personal guarantee that you will repay the loan in full. So uh, worst case scenario, you know, God forbid, uh, things don't go as planned and the property goes back to the lender. If you're doing the loan with the bank, uh, you are responsible to repay the lender in full if they're not able to recover the full principal balance on the loan uh, through selling the property. But with Fannie and Freddie, you can do a deed in lieu foreclosure or also called a friendly foreclosure and go your separate ways from the bank and you know, effectively hand back the keys. And so um, with banks and with full recourse loans in general, uh, you're not just putting your investment into the property at risk, but you're putting uh, your personal balance sheet at risk as well. Um, so loan term, so banks are generally shorter term loans, uh, generally three to five year loans. Uh, Fannie Mae will do five to 30 year loan terms with a fixed rate throughout that period. And then the Freddie Mac Small Balance Program or Freddie SBL, they can provide five, seven, and 10 year uh, loan terms. So another key factor is amortization. So banks typically have a shorter amortization schedule, uh, you know, typically 20, 20 to 25 year amortization while Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will have their loans repaid on a 30-year amortization schedule with one to three years of interest only. And so what does this mean for you as the investor? Well, if you have a loan that has a longer amortization schedule, that means that your principal payments during your loan term are lower, which means that you'll have higher cash flow um, as you'll have a lower principal and interest payment. So. Uh, 30 year amortization, you're amortizing the loan over a 30 year basis, 20 year amortization, you're amortizing it over a 20 year basis. And so with Fannie and Freddie, uh, your cash flow a lot of times is a lot better than it is with a bank, just because your principal and interest payment is much lower. Are we going to talk about interest only on a separate slide, John? Um, we can talk about interest only. Um, I, I don't have a separate slide for interest only, but right. really. Can you, can you describe what interest only um, means to everybody for those that might not be familiar with interest only and, and what that means on, in terms of a loan? Sure. So interest only basically just means that there's no principal payment uh, at all 
during the interest only period. So for instance, on a, a Fannie Mae loan, you might do a 10 year loan with three years of interest only and then 30 year amortization thereafter. So basically that would mean that during the first three years of the loan term, you're only paying interest, you're not paying down any principal. And so your loan payments are, are much lower. Um, after that three year period, uh, the loan would start to amortize and your principal and interest payment would increase. Um, you know, so for instance, if you're doing a $1 million, if you're doing a $1 million loan and you have a 4.5% interest rate, your annual interest payment would be 45,000. Uh, and that's during the interest only period, it would be 45,000. But if you have an amortizing loan with 30 year amortization, it would be higher than that. You know, maybe not, it won't be 45,000, but maybe it'll be 60 or 65,000. Uh, so there'll be, you know, some principal repayment as part of that, that P and I. And can uh, interest only uh, loans, is it only for, for like value add properties? Or is a bank willing to also um, give loans for a turnkey type property as well? Uh, you can get interest only loans for, for both. Um, so sometimes banks or bridge lenders will offer interest only terms for transitional properties. Um, and their thought process there is more so uh, the properties in place cash flow is low. And so, you know, keep the loan payments, let's keep the, the principal and interest payment lower. And it's also a shorter loan term. So you really can't amortize too much principal over a three to five year period. So right. a lot of times with bank loans and with bridge loans, a lot of times you'll be able to get interest only payments, but um, what's nice about Fannie and Freddie is they will offer interest only periods for stabilized or turnkey properties. Great. So, so that would be a Fannie or Freddie to look to for the turnkey properties. Right. Correct. So <clears throat> moving on to maximum LTV or minimum DSCR. So here we're just talking about total loan proceeds and how high of leverage you can get with each different type of financing source. So banks will go up to 75% of purchase price or 75% LTV. Um, and I'll touch on DSCR and what that means here uh, in the next slide. But banks generally, you know, minimum DSCR is very much dependent on the bank. Some banks are very, uh, focused on DSCR and they want to see a property that has at least a 1.20 times DSCR while some other banks, uh, you know, are not as focused on DSCR and will, will finance properties that have a sub 1.0 DSCR. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll overview DSCR here uh, in the next slide, but really what DSCR is, is it's, it's, it's a metric that measures the cash flow the property is generating relative to the total loan payment on the property. And um, can we just define max LTV? Um, so LTV um, is? Yeah, so LTV is loan to value. So okay. if you're doing a, a million dollar loan or if you're, doing a, if you're buying a million dollar property and if you're financing it with a $750,000 loan, that loan amount is 75% of the purchase price. So you're at 75% loan to value. Great. And you will be defining uh, DSCR and it's, it's actual what it stands for on a future slide. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. The next slide. Perfect. So <laughs> Fannie Mae, uh, they can go up to 80% loan to value on an acquisition and 75% loan to value on a refinance. And then they will get down to a 1.25 times debt service coverage ratio. And then Freddie Mac, uh, Freddie SBL, they'll go 75 to 80% on acquisition, 70 to 80% loan to value on a refi, and then down to a 120 to 140 debt service coverage ratio, depending on the market. And I'll go into more detail on Freddie Mac or Freddie Small Balance's view on, on different types of markets and what they'll do in, in the largest markets and what kind of terms they'll offer in the smallest markets. Um, so next slide here, touching on debt service or DSCR. 
which is debt service coverage ratio. There and, you go. Yeah, and debt service coverage ratio is a very common metric that's looked at by lenders and investors in, in multifamily and really in, in all commercial real estate property types. Um, so debt service coverage ratio, ratio is basically your net operating income divided by the annual principal and interest on the property. So for example, um, let's say you're buying a property for $10 million. The net operating income on that property is $500,000. Let's say you want to finance that purchase with an 80% LTV Fannie Mae loan. So that would be a loan amount of $8 million. The interest rate, let's just say it's 4.5%. The amortization is 30 years. And so your annual principal and interest payment is $486,000. And so debt service coverage is the net operating income. So NOI divided by the 486,000. And so 500,000 divided by the 486,000 is at an 80% loan amount is a 1.03 debt service coverage ratio. And the minimum debt service coverage ratio is 1.25 times. And so what the lender would do in this situation is they won't, they won't go up to 80% LTV if you can you know, just barely cover your principal and interest payment at 80% LTV. What they'll do is reduce the loan amount to a loan that could support a 1.25 times DSCR. So in this case, 6.6 million, a 66% LTV. Got it. You, you kind of cut out a little bit there, John. Okay. I'm not, so I'm not sure if something changed about what, about your sitting situation. Okay. Um, let me You're just, back now. Okay. All right. Okay, so going through and talking about property occupancy here, here and what different lenders look for. So banks are flexible or a little bit more lenient on property occupancy. So some banks um, or banks will finance properties that have uh, occupancy that's, that's lower, uh, you know, such as 80% occupancy or lower. Whereas Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they're looking for occupancy of at least 90% for the last 90 days. So banks are often your best source of financing for properties that are a true value add. So maybe it's a property with 70% occupancy or 80% occupancy, or it's a property that's been owned by a mom and pop operator and they don't really have historical financials in the property, uh, or maybe it's you know, all of the above. And under those kinds of conditions, uh, a bank will be better because they are much more flexible about financing non-stabilized or value-add properties that, that have below a 90% occupancy. So rehab, um, so a lot of times multifamily investors, when they're buying a property, uh, they might budget some, or in most cases, they will budget some additional rehab to upgrade the property. Maybe they'll upgrade unit interiors, upgrade some of the common areas, um, address some deferred maintenance. And some of the lenders will finance not just the purchase price, but they'll also finance part of the budgeted rehab. And so if you're buying a property for a million dollars, uh, purchase price is a million. And if your budgeted re rehab is 500,000, they might lend 75 to 80% on that, that 1.5 million or the million dollars in purchase price plus the $500,000 in budgeted rehab. So <laughs> banks uh, will include rehab in the loan or, or may include rehab in the loan dependent on the bank. Uh, Fannie Mae, <clears throat> they will include part of the rehab into the loan. So they can go up to 80% of purchase price plus budgeted rehab but the DSCR must be at 1.25 times. And so they stick with that uh, DSCR threshold. They want the property, the in-place income on the property to be able to cover the annual principal and interest 1.25 times. 
Freddie SBL, they do not finance rehab or they do not include the rehab in the loan amount. They will only finance uh, up to 80% of the purchase price. And I say only, uh, it's almost kind of tongue in cheek. It's uh, still very good loan terms. You know, to be able to get 80% leverage uh, is still very attractive. But it has to be in specific markets, right, John? You'll, you'll talk about that, that it's not every market that, that Freddie will go up to 80% in, correct? Correct. That's right. And, and I'll touch on that here uh, later in this presentation. Um, but just for example, so for some different lending sources, let's say you're doing, let's say you're buying a property for $5 million and you're budgeting $500,000 in rehab with the bank, you can get to 75% of that $5.5 million uh, total cost. So that'd be a loan of $4 million Any May, they could potentially do 80% of 5.5 million or a loan of 4.4 million with your total loan proceeds. <laughs> and then Freddie Small Balance, they would just be at 80% of that $5 million purchase price. So a total loan of $4 million. Nice examples, John. Thank you. People like examples. I've, I've yeah, it makes it very clear. I like examples at least. So moving on to the next topic, which is prepayment. And so prepayment is a key differentiator between these different loan types. And one of the biggest, if not the biggest benefit of financing with the bank. And the reason why I say that is because banks have a limited or no prepayment penalty. So what does this mean for you? Well, we talked about on the property occupancy slide where if you buy a property that's a deep value add property or it's distressed or it has uh, low occupancy, let's say it's 70% occupancy and you lease it from 70% to 95%, you execute your business plan, increase the cash flow, increase the value of the property, you can then do a cash out or a, a cash out refinance or you can sell the property and not have to pay a significant prepayment penalty. So one of the drawbacks of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is you do have uh, a higher prepayment penalty. So Fannie Mae prepayment penalties are generally uh, what's called yield maintenance. And I'll touch on what yield maintenance is in the next slide. And then the Freddie SBL program, they have the option of doing a yield maintenance prepayment penalty or a step down prepayment penalty. Um, both of these prepayment options, the step down and the yield maintenance are generally more expensive and in some cases quite a bit more expensive than the prepayment penalty uh, that a bank would require. So what is yield maintenance and step down prepay? So yes, please tell us. <laughs> they can be confusing, right? Like some people just make the wrong loan decision because they don't realize the impact. They're only looking at the interest rate and they're not looking at the prepayment penalties side of it. And they, they end up getting in the wrong loan because they right. didn't take the time to know this information that you're about to tell. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is important and this is something that, you know, a lot of, a lot of investors will overlook and, um, so what yield maintenance is, is yield maintenance is really a benefit to the lender. And so because it's a benefit to the lender, the lender in return will offer a lower interest rate. So as Anna had mentioned, um, a lot of borrowers will see this lower interest rate and think, oh, I'm getting a great rate with the yield maintenance prepayment penalty. I'll take this option rather than the step down prepayment penalty. And then they'll have some challenges when they go to sell the property or if they want to refi the property. Um, so yield maintenance, basically what that does is it guarantees the lender that they will receive all interest payments on the loan as if the borrower held the loan through maturity. Um, so at the time of payoff, the borrower must pay the net present value of all remaining interest payments on the loan. So for example, um, if you were to do a 10-year Fannie Mae loan, and in year five, if you paid off the loan, uh, the borrower would need to pay the net present value of all remaining interest payments for the remaining five years on that loan, which, Ouch. as you, yeah, is, can, be, can be quite expensive. Um, but the step-down prepay 
it's it's certainly uh, better than the yield maintenance prepayment penalty. And so step down, what that is, is it's, it is a percentage of the loan amount that declines over the loan term. So for instance, with the Freddie Small Balance Program, you can do a 10-year loan with a 5544332211 step down prepay. So your prepayment penalty with this loan would be 5% in year one, or 5% of the loan amount in year one, 5% of the loan amount in year two, 4% in year three, 4% in year four. So kind of using our same example, if you wanted to pay off that 10-year loan in year five, your prepayment penalty would be 3% of the loan amount. 3% of the loan amount at that time with um, the, of, of the over, overall principal that's still due? Correct. Okay. Um, so overall, uh, yield maintenance is, is a much higher prepayment penalty. And when buying a multifamily property, uh, it's very important to have an exit plan, know how you want to sell a property, or if you want to refi the property, when you want to do that, and to finance according to that exit plan. So last uh, overview on these two different programs, we're gonna to touch on borrower experience. And so banks do not require borrower experience. Uh, first time buyers and new investors can finance with banks. But as we mentioned earlier, what banks do require is a personal repayment guarantee. Uh, they're full recourse loans. So a lot of times banks will finance first time investors as long as they have a strong net worth and personal liquidity uh, relative to the loan amount. Um, so they'll finance you know, financially strong investors that may not have multifamily experience but have a strong business plan in place uh, to operate the property. <laughs> Danny May uh, will require that at least one of the key principals uh, has multifamily experience. And so Fannie Mae, uh, is not the lender that will put you in business necessarily, um, unless you're partnering with another investor that has multifamily experience. And that's what I see a lot of newer investors do is if they're buying their first property, maybe they bring in a, a mentor or a colleague that has some experience with multifamily to partner with them and sign on loan with them as a key principal. And that will allow them to qualify for a, a Fannie Mae loan. What if somebody's new to multifamily, but they're very experienced in like commercial office in terms of, of commercial office real estate? Would Fannie Mae consider that or does it have to be multifamily experience? So that would, that would not count as multifamily experience. And so Fannie Mae, uh, they consider multifamily experience to be experience signing on a loan as a guarantor and acting as a general partner on a, a multifamily property. So having full or, or a control, full ownership or controlling interest in the LLC that owns a multifamily property. Okay, um, and again, a multifamily property is five units and above. It doesn't count if people have a bunch of duplexes and fourplexes and single families. That's not gonna add up to multifamily experience for Fannie Mae, is that correct? That's right. That's right. So yeah, experience in single family or experience in four units and below, or if you have experience as a, as a property manager or a property management company, uh, you know, or if your full-time job is working with a, a, some type of multifamily company, that would not count. Uh, they consider multifamily experience to be uh, experience owning and operating uh, multifamily properties. So for Fannie Mae, again, how many years of experience is Fannie really looking for in terms of multifamily experience? Like what, what, what point does somebody cross that boundary or that threshold with Fannie? Yeah, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a gray area. So they don't really have a box necessarily. Um, so for instance, you know, if you are, let's say you're buying a 200 unit property in Atlanta, and the only other multifamily property that you own is a 10 unit property in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Fannie Mae might look at that and say, this is not enough experience. 
thing to bring on an additional key principal that has more experience or has relevant experience. Um, but let's say you're buying an 80 unit property, in a, or let's say you're buying a 200 unit property and you already own an 80 unit property in Atlanta and you've successfully operated it for one or two years, uh, that might be enough experience to qualify for a Fannie Mae loan. And so it's a little bit of a, of a gray area, and it's definitely something that we encounter quite often. And, and you know, having, um, you know, at least presenting a case as to why a key principal or why a borrower has enough experience for Fannie Mae, um, you know, on, on different loans that we work on. But thank goodness there's the Freddie, Freddie Mac small balance. Right. So Freddie's small balance is, is much more lenient uh, with, first, with newer or first-time investors. And so Freddie will oftentimes accept new investors. And I, I have case-by-case -case basis here because, you know, obviously there will be pushback on certain, on certain cases if you are a first-time investor. Um, so... And specifically, yep. new uh, first-time multifamily investor is—is is that what you're intending to say here? Right. Yeah, a, a new multifamily investor. Um, so in top and standard markets, you know, Freddie will finance first-time investors. Uh, the key thing with Freddie Small Balance is they want you to have a qualified third-party property manager, and if you have a qualified third-party property manager, and if you meet the net worth and liquidity requirements, and so with Freddie Small Balance. The personal net worth and liquidity requirements are uh, a net worth equal to 100% of the loan amount, liquidity equal to 10% of the loan amount. So if you meet the net worth and liquidity requirements and you have a professional third party property manager to manage the property, uh, Freddie will finance newer uh, or less experienced multifamily investors. Great. So to summarize um, all the different points here on different loan types, um, and are there any questions out there that I can, I can answer about these different loan types and different requirements? Um, okay, so, so everybody take, take a gander at this. We've got everything he just went over summarized now into one table. So you can look across each loan type and kind of say, well, what's, you know, what's the best? Um, so uh, Kenny's asking, how do you break in if you don't have the net worth? Yeah, so what a lot of newer investors will do or what people will do if they don't have the net worth or don't need the net worth and liquidity requirements is they will partner uh, with some other investors that do have the requirements. Um, so a lot of times, you know, for instance, if you're buying a $5 million property, and if you're going to finance that acquisition with a $4 million loan, the net worth requirements would be that you and the key principals that are signed on that loan have a net worth equal to $4 million and then personal liquidity <laughs> equal to $400,000. And a lot of people don't have that net worth and that liquidity, or they might have the net worth, they don't have liquidity, or they might have liquidity, they don't have the net worth. And so what a lot of people will do is they will find uh, other investors or other people that are interested in investing in multifamily uh, that would be willing to sign on the loan with them. And then collectively, they can get the combined net worth up to that $4 million loan amount, uh, or that, as an example, that $4 million loan amount and the liquidity up to that $400,000. So a lot of times people will qualify uh, by partnering with other like-minded individuals. So if somebody needs a principal just for their experience to qualify or for their net worth, let's extend it to those, you know, more than just the experience, how is ownership divided if the other people don't put in any money? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. I mean, I think people that, that sign on loans and people that are part of that sponsorship team that you're talking about. So, you know, maybe one partner has a net worth and liquidity that allows you to qualify for a loan. Maybe one partner finds the deal, underwrites the acquisition, and basically sources the acquisition. Uh, one person might do the asset management post-closing, um, and then another person might be responsible for actually raising the equity and might have contacts who are willing to invest 
you know, fifty to one hundred thousand dollars into a uh, you know SEC compliant five hundred six for MB syndication for a multifamily property. Um, and so the way the sponsorship and what the way that ownership is divided is is really dependent on the the team and what they decide. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules or regulations uh, with with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac in terms of how that's all divided. Uh, what they're really looking for is that the combined net worth is equal to you know, those minimum thresholds and that you know, if it's a Fannie Mae loan, that someone on the team has experience owning and operating multi-family properties. How much is uh, the small balance loan amount? So, what yeah. And, and SBL, can we we could just establish that SBL stands for small balance, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Freddie Freddie Mac SBL stands for small balance loans, uh, and the loan sizes range from one million to seven point five million. So so one million to say it again, John, please. To seven point five million. Seven point five million. Okay. Great. Is there a reason why there are personal net worth and liquidity requirements if the loans are non-recourse? Yeah, so that's a good question, and that, that comes up pretty often. You know, if it's non-recourse and there's no personal guarantee, why do they care what my net worth and liquidity is? Well, the lender wants to lend to a borrower that, that has strong financial wherewithal. And so they don't want you as the investor to be putting every last dollar of your savings in, into the property. They want to make sure that you, know, you have significant financial wherewithal so that if there is an issue on the property, you know, whether it be deferred maintenance, you know, if the chiller or boiler goes out and you've got to replace that or if occupancy declines for some reason, that you have the financial wherewithal to support the property. Um, if, if we were, we assume a loan, I presume we are subject to all of the terms, including the yield maintenance. Is that correct? correct? Okay. That's right. And then um, adding on to that, do lenders review your loan on a regular basis to ensure that the property still has a healthy DSCR or debt service coverage ratio? So banks a lot of times will have an ongoing debt service coverage ratio covenant where they will monitor your property. And if the debt service coverage ratio dips below their minimum required covenant, so let's say it's a one, you have to maintain a 1.20 times debt service coverage ratio, um, you know, that could potentially be a, a breach of, of the covenant. And if that covenant is not cured, then it could be an event of default. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do not have ongoing debt service coverage requirements. Uh, so if your debt service coverage dips below 1.25 or 1.20 during your loan term, uh, you know, there's no, there's no breach of covenant, there's no event, event of default, as long as you continue to make your principal and interest payments uh, on time and, and keep current with your loan. How do lenders feel about the down payment coming from other people's money? Uh, also a good question, you know, I think the lenders typically wants to see the sponsorship uh, have at least some skin in the game. And so I always advise people if they are doing a syndication and raising equity from other investors, uh, I always recommend that the sponsor invest at least the minimum uh, contribution for their syndication into the, the deal, uh, both just to kind of show alignment of interest with their investors and their partners, but then also uh, for the bank. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, there's actually not a hard and fast requirement that uh, an investor contributes uh, cash into the deal with, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but I think that if you really want to uh, maximize your certainty of execution, get the best loan terms possible, and also align your interest with your investors, I think you should be investing at least the minimum contribution into the property. So if, uh, if your minimum equity requirement is $50,000, uh, I think each one of the sponsors should be investing at least $50,000. Okay, we've got, still have some questions, but let's let our time is ticking away. So let's uh, continue and we'll catch these questions at the end.
Okay. Uh, so continuing on. Um, so we touched on uh, bank loans, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So I'll run through bridge loans uh, here very briefly, just because bridge loans have become a more common source of financing in the multifamily market, you know, especially in the most in the more recent years. Um, the bridge loans are loans for value-add properties that have significant upside. And so the bridge loan's purpose is basically taking a, a property from being non-stabilized or underperforming to being fully stabilized and reaching its full potential. So for example, if you're buying a 60% occupied property and the purchase price is $5 million and you think the stabilized value of that property is $7.5 million, then a bridge loan uh, may be a good option for you. Um, so bridge loans are really for experienced borrowers that have significant net worth, liquidity, and experience owning and investing in multifamily properties. And there are a number of different types of sources of bridge loans. So there's hard money lenders, there's debt funds, there's life insurance companies that have bridge loan programs, and uh, there's, there's mortgage rates as well. And Banks can technically serve as bridge lenders, and a lot of times bank loans are actually bridge loans. But for the purposes of this presentation, when I refer, when I refer to bridge loans, I'm referring to non-recourse non -recourse loans, uh, or the source of funds is some type of non-bank lender, like the different sources I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's really no box for bridge loans necessarily, but I would say the general terms are for non-recourse, uh, they'll go to 80% of the purchase price plus budgeted rehab. They can offer two to three year terms with extension options and the prepayment penalties are limited. Uh, they're usually, you know, six to 18 months of minimum interest, meaning that you have to make at least you know, six months of interest payments or 12 months of interest payments. So if you have 12 months of minimum interest and you want to pay off the bridge loan in month nine, you would then have to pay those last three months of interest at the time of prepayment, plus any other exit fees. And interest only is also um, sometimes an option on bridge loans as well, correct? Correct. Yeah, and, and bridge loans are almost always interest only, you know, at least during the two to three year initial term. Uh, they might require amortization during the extensions, but more often than not, they will have interest only during that, that three year term. And then the last thing with non-recourse bridge loans is that the interest rates are higher. So, you know, probably the absolute lowest you go with a bridge loan would be a 5.75% interest rate. Um, and that's based on, you know, I'm assuming a lot of times these bridge loans are quoted over 30-day uh, LIBOR. Um, and so 30-day LIBOR is currently about 2.5%. And the lowest rates I'm seeing on non-recourse bridge loans right now on B and C multifamily properties is 30-day LIBOR plus 3.25%. And so that would be an all-in rate of about 5.75. And so I would say rates start at about 55 5.75%, but they can, they can go higher than that. They're also variable as opposed to fixed, correct, John? Right, yeah, so they're they're variable or also called floating rates. Um, and so, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans are fixed. Sometimes banks will do a three-year fixed rate loan or a five-year fixed rate loan, uh, but typically uh, bridge loans are floating rate or variable. And somebody told me that uh, bridge loans uh, close faster than Fannie or Freddie, but are more expensive. Is this true, John? It really just depends on, on the source of, of the bridge loan. So, um, you know, you can do a hard money bridge loan that, will, that can close in 10 days. And hard money lenders don't require third party reports, which are appraisals. Uh, you know, a phase one environmental report or a property condition report, and the closing costs on those will be, will be pretty low. Yes, I can imagine. 
Yeah, or you can do a you know a fifteen million dollar bridge loan with a non recourse debt fund um, out of New York, and you know you can be required to pay for the lender legal fees for whichever expensive law firm they're they're using out of New York, and you know have fifty thousand dollars in legal fees, and then have significant origination fees. So it really just depends. Uh, but the closing typically is faster than a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, as those loans typically take 45 to 60 days to close. Great. All right. Any more questions on bridge loans? From the um, we just had two that are specific to, to this. Uh, so these loans are non-Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, correct? The bridge loans are not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Right. Okay. And um, can you use a bridge loan as a, is that like a construction loan? Uh, you can use bridge loans for if you're doing a significant value add project. I mean, if you're really uh, vacating all of the units and taking, you know, the property really down to the studs and doing a full gut, gut renovation, uh, you can do a bridge loan potentially. Um, and again, it's, it's, uh, bridge loans, there really is no box. Um, you know, they can finance, you know, you can find almost any kind of lender for, for any type of situation. So, you know, they'll, they'll, they can potentially finance properties that have, you know, a DSCR that's well below 1.0, um, you know, very low occupancy and a very large rehab budget. And in that case, uh, you know, for that or for a construction loan, an interest reserve would be required, where basically the lender would, would lend you funds to pay the interest on the loan. Okay, great. Well, I think we've got to move on where our, our time is, is ticking away. So okay. much great information. All right. So Freddie Mac small balance loans. So just to run through in some more detail on the Freddie SBL program. And so the loan size for Freddie SBL is one to six million. They can go up to 7.5 million in some of the larger markets we'll touch on here in one of the next slides. They can go, Freddie can go up to 80% LTV and down to a 1.20 times debt service coverage ratio. Uh, they can do non-recourse, 30 year amortization, interest only is available. They can offer competitive fixed rate pricing. And one benefit with Fred SBL is that the rate is locked at loan application. They can offer five, seven, and 10 year terms, and then also flexible points based prepay. Um, so, Freddie Mac SBL sizing parameters. And so, um, you know, real estate is all about location, location, location. And Freddie's view on that is no different. And so, they will offer the most loan proceeds and the lowest interest rates in the largest, uh, most liquid markets. So, you know, markets like New York, Los Angeles, uh, Miami, Seattle, Dallas, et cetera, they'll go to an 80% LTV on acquisition and refi, and it'll go down to a 1.20 times that's this coverage ratio. And then in the, the smallest markets, um, so as you move into smaller markets, they start to dial back their loan proceeds a little bit. And so the next tier down would be a standard market. Um, so markets like Salt Lake City, Phoenix, or Indianapolis would be considered a standard market. They'll go to 80% LTV in these standard markets, but their DSCR constrained at a 1.25 times that service coverage ratio which ultimately means lower loan proceeds. And then the next level down, we have small markets and very small markets, uh, where your small markets are places like Green Bay, Wisconsin, and Montgomery, Alabama, and then very small markets uh, would be the Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or in Abilene, Texas. And so loan proceeds are, are lower as you move into some of these smaller markets, um, and the interest rates are also higher. But the good news about Freddie Small Balance is uh, you know, they'll finance in some of the largest markets, but then also in very small markets. And in a lot of cases, uh, Freddie Small Balance can still make sense in some of these very small markets 
Uh, I just recently closed a loan actually in, in Abilene, Texas. Oh, so. there you go. I, I just want to um, uh, add here that one of the things that I call John about regularly is to find out for the market that I'm underwriting, what are these numbers? It's very important when you're underwriting a deal to make sure that you are matching up with, with what the lenders are making available to you. And I encourage you, you know, everybody wants to find their market. Well, once you find your market, find out what the numbers are that the lenders are lending. And John Brixen is a great resource for that. Um, you'll have his email at the end of the presentation, and he's always happy to give you that information for your markets that you're interested in. Right, John? Right, absolutely. And, and actually, you know, in small and very small markets, a lot of times uh, Fannie Mae will actually offer better loan terms in these markets um, because they're not as constrained. So they'll go to 75% and down to a 130 or a 125 that service coverage ratio in some of these small and very small markets and then offer uh, better interest rates. So I actually uh, just happened to be closing a loan in Sioux Falls, South Dakota on Thursday. Uh, that's actually a refi and we're doing 75% of value. Um, the rate's about 4.55%, which is nice. very attractive. Yeah, and that's good. You could get interest only, but we're not doing uh, the borrower like it not to take it. So um, it just depends on which market you're investing in. Um, so moving on, so I've mentioned that I think Freddie SBL is the best program uh, for a lot of investors, especially you know, newer or first time investors. And Freddie SBL is it's pretty similar to Fannie Mae and what Fannie Mae can offer. Um, you know, that's non-recourse, they're fixed rate loans with 30 year amortization. But unlike Fannie Mae, Freddie can offer flexible declining prepayment options. Freddie can lock the interest rate at loan application. Which and is then, amazing, by the way. Yeah, which is definitely amazing. And then they can also finance uh, first time multifamily investors. So continuing on, how, how does one qualify for Freddie SPL and what are kind of the key requirements? So there's property level requirements and then also borrower level requirements that are important. So on the property level, the property needs to be stabilized or at least 90% occupied for the past 90 days prior to loan closing. Uh, the loan size we've already touched on, net worth, uh, key principles need that combined net worth equal to 100% of loan amount, and then liquidity equal to 10% uh, of the loan amount or really technically it's nine months of principal and interest. Uh, a 10% of the loan amount is always the rule of thumb that I use. And then they also require that you have a qualified third party property manager to manage the asset. So running through the acquisition timeline here uh, real quick. So from the time you first see a property and think you might want to underwrite it to the time you actually close on the acquisition. So day one, uh, potential acquisition is identified. Uh, you think it's a property that you might want to underwrite and that you might want to make an offer on, I would actually suggest that you reach out to your lender or mortgage broker very early on in the process. And as soon as you see something that you think might look interesting and try to find out what kind of financing that property might qualify for. And so once you have a good idea for what kind of loan terms uh, the property would qualify for, you can underwrite the property, uh, underwrite the acquisition if it's something you like, you can move forward with submitting an LOI, and then once you have that LOI accepted, at that point you can request a loan application, negotiate your PSA, and then ideally, uh, once you have that loan application signed, or once you have that uh, purchase and sale agreement signed and you're under contract, you can be in a position to sign a loan, loan application and wire the expense deposit. And so, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans typically take 45 to 60 days to close. And most purchase contracts for multifamily properties that I see are 60 day contracts with one or two 15 day extension options. So you wanna be in a position where you have a signed loan application uh, as soon as you are under contract or shortly after under contract. And so um, the closing time frame generally, you know, day one, loan application signed, day two, uh, third party reports are ordered, 
the due diligence checklist is provided to the borrower, and then the inspection dates are arranged. By day 21, all the due diligence has been provided. Third party reports have been completed. Uh, two weeks later, the lender has completed their underwriting package and their presentation for Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, which they've submitted uh, to Freddie for approval. And then day 45, uh, Freddie Mac provides their approval with the loan commitment letter. And then uh, from there on out, you know, it's typically another five to seven business days to close the loan. And so, and I think you wanted to hop in real quick uh, with a quick update. Yes, I'm going to hop in real quick here. And I'm going to bring this over here. I'm going to actually share that screen and I'm going to bring this in and I'm just going to tell you guys very quickly that if you're interested in apartment investing, this is the type of information that we um, cater to our bootcamp students and bring them incredible value in teaching them how to buy their own apartment buildings. Some of you may know this guy, Neil Bawa. He is known for helping people to become financially free by teaching them about real estate. Again, he's known these days as the mad scientist of multifamily because of the innovations that he brings to the industry. And he teaches his students all of his tricks. So it is a fact that multifamily, as John and I were talking about earlier, is the real estate investing, as a real estate investing asset, it has proven to be one of the best asset classes for long-term wealth accumulation. And Neil teaches the last honest apartment boot camp in America. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at the three promises it makes. The first promise is that training is eye-opening, specific, and tangible. And it is absolutely meant to be used right away. So if we look at the testimonial from Anya here, it's she talking about the tools that they were able to begin putting into practice right away, such as looking how to determine which markets have the greatest potential for growth and cash flow and how to drill down to the specific neighborhoods within those markets and then how to find teams and how to build teams the, the training you're able to use right away as she says the second promise is that it is pitch free this is not the type of training that you go to and you pay money for a weekend or three or four days and the whole time that you're at that training they're trying to convince you to go to the $20,000 training or the $40,000 training, they're just trying to upsell you the whole time. That's not the way we roll. It, it, there is no mentoring or tapes offered. This is, this is it. What we do in the boot camp, we teach you what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and all of the innovations that we come up with on how to acquire and asset manage apartment buildings. The final promise is that it is filled with shortcuts secrets and strategies that you've never seen before. Why have you never seen them before? Because Neil created them. This isn't something he learned from somebody else and then he's teaching you re rehashed stuff someone else thought of. He's teaching you stuff that he created. He created using free tools. He created using various hacks that he comes up with on how to innovate and, and, uh, and, and make apartment buildings successful for not only his students, but his investors. So you can see Asoso talking about how the bootcamp provided him with a clear and precise roadmap to identify specific locations. And he can state unequivocally that this bootcamp was by far one of the best that he's attended. So if you are interested, we have a bootcamp coming up June 3rd. It's six live sessions. It's an e-bootcamp, which means you can log in from the comfort of your home but they are live, so it's very interactive. You can ask questions, and Neil is going to answer every single person's question throughout the entire session. There is no, he doesn't hold back on any of that. Um, if you want more information, this is the link here, multifamilyu.com slash bootcamp. You can currently take advantage of $800 discount. This is the super early bird price. If you wait, then you're going to face the super early bird price is going to end and the price will go up $400. If you wait longer than that, then you'll be up to normal pricing. So if you have interest, check out this uh, link and you can get all kinds of more information about the 
modules that are included in the session in the sessions um, I teach the underwriting and Neil teaches the other sessions about raising money uh, talking to brokers uh, we do lending we do all kinds of stuff so that my friend I'm ready to hand back to you I'm going to stop sharing and have you resume all right perfect well, great. We will uh, get this presentation here wrapped up with a, a couple of just quick case studies uh, for some recent pretty small balance loans that I closed. And so this first case study, um, I really like this one because this was a first time multifamily investor that bought a property. You know, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I always encourage people to target properties that are either already worth 1.5 million or could potentially be worth at least 1.5 million upon stabilization. And this was a case where the purchase price on this property when they acquired it was $1 million and they, they budgeted $200,000 in CapEx to improve the property. This is a seven unit property in the Seattle area. And so as I mentioned, it was a $1 million purchase which occurred in July, 2017. They invested $200,000 in CapEx for a total cost basis of 1.2 million. They financed the acquisition and rehab with a $950,000 recourse uh, bank loan with a local credit union or local bank. And then in November of 2018, after they had executed their business plan, they finished the rehab, at least up all seven of the units. Uh, we did a cash out refi with Freddie Small Balance at 1.2 38 million, which was 115% of their cost basis. And that was only after 15 months of ownership. Um, wow. So that's one way it can work um, for some smaller multifamily properties or properties that might not be worth, uh, you know, 1.5 million when you retire them, but then once they're stabilized, uh, it could make sense for a very small balance. Um, Case study number two, this was a pretty straightforward uh, Freddie Small Balance loan for an acquisition on a property in Garland, Texas. So this was an out-of-state investor that had some multifamily experience. They owned some properties in their local market, but they really wanted to get into the DFW market. And so they bought this 32-unit property. And we talked earlier about the step-down prepayment and knowing about uh, you know, what your exit would be on you know, when you go to acquire a multifamily property. And so a lot of times for newer investors that are buying some of these smaller properties, I often recommend a step down prepay because what we have found is that when people buy these properties, these smaller properties, they decide one of two things, you know, they either decide they want to sell the property and move into something larger and scale up, or they decide that they want to sell the property and they don't want to be an active multifamily owner. They just want to invest passively with people like uh, Neil and Anna. And so uh, that being said, I, I always recommend step down prepay instead of a yield maintenance prepay. And so this borrower, they did a 78% LTV loan. It was a seven year loan with two years of interest only uh, and step down prepay. So pretty clean uh, execution for that. So wrapping up here with a quick overview of old capital lending. Uh, so we are a DFW based multifamily lender. Uh, you know, I'd say we have a Texas focus and a national expertise. Uh, we definitely pride ourselves on putting people into business. So a lot of our largest borrowers and largest clients today, uh, you know, people with over a thousand units under management started out with us uh, you know, with no multifamily properties or no multifamily experience, or they are transitioning from single family to multifamily, and we've grown with them and helped them scale their business, really grow in the business. Um, so we focus on B and C multifamily properties. That's all we do. Uh, you know, there's certainly interesting uh, property types out there like self-storage or retail or industrial, but we really want to specialize and be experts in our space. So I can say with near certainty that any loan that you do with us is a loan that we've done with that specific lender uh, many times over and have financed many uh, similar types of situations throughout the country. Uh, we're a smaller group, but very active. Uh, we closed over a billion dollars in 2018. And a lot of people know us because of our podcast 
which is hosted by uh, Paul Peebles, who is the guy on the left. He's the head of Old Capital Lending. And his co-host is Michael Becker, who is formerly a loan officer with Old Capital, uh, but in, you know, a few years back, uh, transitioned from being a loan officer to being a full-time syndicator and sponsor. And so Michael Becker has bought and sold uh, over 7,000 units in the Dallas, Fort Worth, and Austin markets during this cycle. And so our podcast really is just those two talking about uh, multifamily investing. Uh, we have a lot of our clients on the podcast. Uh, we have listing brokers, property management companies, uh, and other people who are active in the multifamily space. So definitely recommend you check it out. And then lastly, for any uh, upcoming Old Capital events, we have our Old Capital Multifamily Conference, which we just announced uh, we're, we're going to be having uh, in October of this year. Uh, so last year we had a conference. Uh, our well, last year our conference we had uh, 650 to 700 attendees. Uh, this year we're expecting to have just as many, if not more. So we'll be doing the conference on October 25th. We haven't announced the venue yet. Uh, we'll be going that out here in the next couple of weeks, um, but should be a great event. And then the last thing I'd say, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, I recommend following the Old Capital Facebook page or going to the oldcapitalpodcast.com to find out about future uh, events with Old Capital. So <clears throat> closing it up here, uh, next steps in Q&A. So next steps, I'd say, uh, is number one, education. Subscribe to the Old Capital Podcast, like our Facebook page, and of course, uh, you know, try to sign up and look into every multifamily U event there is, uh, because Anna and Neil and the rest of their team put out some great content. Um, yeah. so getting education is, is a key next step. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, complete a personal financial statement, get a feel for where your net worth and liquidity is, and understand you need a key principal, you need a potential partner, how large of a loan could you qualify for? And you can also set up a time to talk to me about multifamily financing, about investing, uh, about you know, what your plans are for multifamily and what you wanna do. Uh, the third thing would be building your team. So adding a strong lender to your team, of course, uh, is part of it, but then you know, additional key principals if needed, uh, attorneys, property managers, et cetera. And at that point, you can start underwriting new listings, making offers, and then finally, last but not least, would be close the deal. So with that being said, Anna, thank you for having me on tonight. I'll hand it. Yeah, I've got some questions for you, John. You're not going anywhere for a few minutes, so let's let's roll through some questions, baby. So here, right. I'm going to throw up a poll here, and you guys, uh, while you're you're listening to the um, questions and answers um you can if you would just please uh take our poll i'm going to go through uh, some for you here now john uh, in this current lending climate are you seeing lenders exercise due on sale clause due on sale clause um, i have not seen that exercised uh in the, in the current environment okay Let's see. Uh, do these loans come? I know we've answered this, but this is a little bit more specific. Do these loans come for fourplexes in high cost areas like, like the Bay Area? They do not. Uh, so, yeah, Fannie and Freddie is really only for five units and above. Um, okay. I'd say high cost areas like the Bay Area, you know, you can get a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan on a five unit property just because the valuations are so high and the rents are so high. So I'd say instead of a fourplex, maybe get a five to 12 unit property. Great, great answer. Do lenders use actual rents or projected rents to qualify loans? So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will do actual rents and in place income. Uh, a lot of times bank loans and bridge lenders will determine if they want to do the loan or not on projected rents or on pro forma but Fannie and Freddie will underwrite to in place. Okay, um, let's see. For uh, small balance loans, can we lower the down payment by cross collateralizing, oh, that's a tough word, collateralizing and get to the required DSCR? 
You cannot, no. Okay. Uh, uh, one of our um, people is saying, John is going to be my go-to multifamily guy. All right. <laughs> and he adds on, how, how does Freddie determine the qualification of the property manager? Uh, it's also, it's, you know, it's not, you don't have to have a large professional operator. Um, it can be somebody that has 200 units or 100 units under management. The key thing with having a third party property manager, what they really look for is they want you to have a property management agreement that basically allows you as the owner to terminate the property management agreement with 30 day notice. And so, you know, ideally you have an experienced property management company that has a number, you know, a good amount of units under management. But if you have a strong, you know, local operator that has a good amount of experience, uh, that can provide a, a property management agreement um, that, that's compliant with Freddie's requirements, uh, that will usually pass. Um, are there some creative funding options for startup companies similar to Open Door that is uh, for multifamily? Um, I mean, those would be more geared towards venture capital or business loans. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you're funding something like Open Door or some other kind of uh, real estate tech startup, um, you know, you're really lending on operating business and not on the actual real estate itself. And so can't provide much guidance there, admittedly. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate lender, not a, not a venture capitalist, unfortunately. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see, let's go for this one. Will it be difficult to refinance a bridge loan in three years if there is a recession? If so, do you recommend long-term fixed rate debt? Yeah, absolutely, and good question. And so uh, bridge loans, the risky thing with, with bridge loans and, and with bank loans or any loans that are short-term is that they're short-term loans and you have a maturity in the next 24 months or the next 36 months or three years where if the loan matures during a downturn, uh, you can be in a situation where it becomes very difficult to refinance your existing loan. Um, and so, you know, what I tell people is you can't predict the next downturn, but you can be prepared for the next downturn. And one way to do that is to lock in long-term non-recourse fixed rate finance where you know, if you have a 10 year loan and if there is a downturn in year three or four, you can continue to make your principal and interest payments. Uh, you can continue to pay down principal. And then once that loan comes due in year 10, the loan balance is amortized enough that you can refi the property even if there is a downturn during that time just because the loan balance is low enough. I just would add to that that sometimes a bridge loan is the right tool in the toolkit for the project if it's a heavy lift project that you know you you need to use the bridge loan to get in on and you're you're going to be raising the value of the property within two years so that it, you know even if there is a downturn you've got you've created such a big cushion uh in terms of of raising the noi of the property um and because of the the ways you can get out of a bridge loan versus um long-term debt to refinance, it, sometimes it's the right tool for the for the for the pro, for the project. So, yeah, um, is old capital considered hard money, private money? What 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 is old capital considered? So, old capital is a mortgage broker, and so we work with multifamily investors and help them. We arrange financing on any uh, properties that they are acquiring. So the way we get paid is we get paid 1% of the loan amount at closing. And we only get paid if the loan closes. Are there any restrictions in terms of minimum population where the property is located? No. And that's one of the benefits with Fannie and Freddie is that you know, they'll land in almost any market in the country. Uh, obviously, there's certain uh, exceptions here and there where they won't land, but for the most part, They'll lend in all markets in the country, even in smaller towns. Um, 
obviously they're not going to offer the same loan terms in a very small town. They'll offer in a much larger city. But yes, they'll, they'll go almost anywhere where they can. Um, do you have specific due diligence requirements? Uh, there are specific due diligence requirements. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of items. So kind of the three, three or four main items is, you know, there's, there's a lot of due diligence that's required on the key principles in the loan. So the people that are signing as the loan guarantors, they need to basically give authorization to the lender to do a full credit and background search on them and kind of run a background on, on them as, as borrowers. Um, they have to provide personal financial statements uh, that are signed and get you know, that are signed and certified. They've got to provide bank statements, kind of confirming that the liquidity and the cash they represent on their personal financial statements is in fact uh, on those statements. Um, they need to provide a, a detailed uh, schedule of real estate owned, where basically um, you know you're you're detailing each property you own, how the property is performing, and then there's also a number of diligence items uh, that are required for the property, you know, such as historical financials, budget and capex, the pro forma, uh, insurance information, utility bills, real estate tax, you know, historical real estate taxes, uh, a number of different items. And so the diligence requirements will, will vary from lender to lender and for you know, different situations. Um, you know, I'd be happy to provide kind of a preliminary due diligence list anyone that, that wants to reach out, but, um, but yes, there are specific diligence requirements. The lenders require PMI? Uh, they do not, no. Okay, and again, we've got a lot of people really trying to buy fourplexes and duplexes. Do you guys also find lenders for fourplexes and duplexes in high cost areas since you're mortgage brokers? Yeah, we do not. Uh, we do not provide uh, lenders for fourplexes and duplexes, you know, or those would be residential mortgages. And you know, one thing I, I often tell people who are looking at fourplexes and duplexes is, you know, those those can be great investments. Um, but the key difference between lending on a fourplex versus lending on a five unit, and that that crossover once you go from four units to five units, is on five units and above. For a commercial multifamily loan, the loan and the value is really based on cash flow the property is generating. Um, and so, you know, if you increase the rent significantly, and you know you're able to get higher loan proceeds because you have higher rents, uh, the property will qualify. Whereas on a fourplex, the loan proceeds are largely driven by um, sales comps in the area. And so, if you're limited to 80% LTV. Even if you've increased the rents significantly above sales comps in the immediate area, uh, your loan proceeds are going to be limited to you know, where the property where the property appraisal comes in, and that's going to be based on the sales comps. And, and it's also based on the personal borrower and <clears throat> much more based on personal financials of the of the borrower and the owner of that fourplex, whereas you know, with multifamily, not as much. Very, very significant difference going from, from four to five and understanding the valuation of, of that changes between that. Um, that's a really key factor. And once people really wrap their head around what it is to be a multifamily and what net operating income, that magical thing really means with commercial real estate, I think a lot of people stop looking at duplexes and fourplexes altogether and single family. They are just yeah. done with them once they realize what the real, the true magic of commercial multifamily and the valuation that's that's in there, it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah. We have when to wrap say, this up. Sorry, John. Go ahead. You wanted to say yeah, one more thing. You know, real quick, I was just saying when people say you can scale in multifamily a lot faster, I mean there's a number of different things they mean, but that's a key component when it comes to being able to scale, meaning building a large portfolio, is you're much more restricted. Uh, and adding more loans to your balance sheet uh, with single family or four unit below uh, investing. Whereas multifamily investing, there's really no limit. Um, you can continue to do non-recourse uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans with no restrictions. That's a great point. Yeah, it's a great point. We still have some questions out there, but our time is up. We've actually gone 
for a very long period this time because of all the great content that, that John's been providing and all the questions he's been answering. So please, um, we will answer your questions. I will um, provide John the answer, the questions that, that were in the chat that he hadn't gotten to yet. And you can always email John um, directly and we are happy to answer those questions. Again, John, thank you so much for spending the time with me at this presentation. And I'm really looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on and always enjoy hanging out with you and Neil. Yeah, I, uh, we do as well, John. And we look forward to seeing you at the next conference. And we look forward to closing the next deal with you very, in the very soon, uh, the very near future. Absolutely. So, all right. Good night, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.